Good afternoon. I'm Diana Lawson. I'm the Dean of the Seidman College of Business, and I welcome you to the Seidman College of Business COVID-19 webinar series uh, for West Michigan Business. Today's webinar is going to focus on averting bankruptcy. We have Chris Harper from the Seidman College of Business, who is a CPA, as well as uh, an instructor of accounting in uh, Seidman College and owns a business and has probably faced a lot of the same things you all are facing. Chris will be our moderator today, and so I'm going to turn it over to him to introduce the panelists. Chris? Okay, thanks, Diana. So we have a panelist, uh, four panelists today. Krista Flynn is the regional president for Chemical Bank. She has more than 25 years of experience in the financial industry. And I think she's going to give us some great perspective regarding uh, what we can expect from bankers and how, how that relationship with a banker is so critical. Uh, we also have Holly Jackson with us. She's an attorney with Kuiper Kramer PC, uh, joined also by, um, alongside her, Bob Wolford uh, from Miller Johnson. So we have two legal perspectives here, one from Holly Jackson, another from Bob Wolford, and then finally, uh, last but not least, Doug Wolterdink with DWH has uh, more than 40 years of experience in corporate finance, public accounting, management, consulting, restructuring, and turnaround. So I think, uh, I think we have a nice panel here to try to get some perspective on averting bankruptcy right now. So uh, why don't we start out with, um, we'll start out with Krista. Uh, um, you know, just kind of, if you could please just, let me know what are some of your initial thoughts as you think about the possibility of bankruptcy for a business in, in today's climate. Great, yeah, exactly. Uh, thanks, Chris. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Krista Flynn, um, as you said, regional president at Chemical Bank, soon to be called TCF Bank uh, here in West Michigan. I've been in uh, commercial banking for over 25 years and, and like all of you, um, have never experienced an environment really anything like this. Um, we talked a little bit as a group beforehand uh, about this about this webinar, and we all decided um, how we really are going to approach the conversation is more of a way to avoid insolvency, or said maybe with the glass half full of bolstering a uh, going concern. An actual bankruptcy is a legal remedy that Bob and Holly can certainly address, and, and there's a whole range of stages before ever contemplating bankruptcy that um, are certainly important to talk about. And I'll start with a, a banker's perspective in the current um, banking environment. So I kind of think um, about where we're at in three buckets. First is our immediate focus, which I can really state in one word, liquidity. With the economy shut down, PPP loans funding, and no clear vision to the future restart of the workforce, we're looking at um, current cash position, weekly cash burn, 13-week cash flows for all of our middle market clients. Um, most banks have also processed many principal deferrals uh, to help companies through this, hopefully, um, temporary freeze. Then there's the, the next bucket is really the intermediate term, where we're starting to look at what companies may anticipate when things open back up a little bit. So that includes potential working capital ramp-ups and, and what that might look like for borrowing bases or collateral positions. We're starting to think about what the PPP forgiveness process is going to look like and also um, if additional deferment periods might be needed uh, at, at the time when they um, uh, end. And then the third bucket is really for later in 2020. We're anticipating that unfortunately um, some of the winners and losers will start to emerge. Um, we're, we'll start to recognize which industries will have a long-term um, effect and, and maybe start to understand what our new normal norm of operation is. Um, as, as we're navigating the unknown, what can you expect from your bank? And I would say, um, I think an important thing to acknowledge right now is that the government lending programs, both PPP and Main Street lending, are not going to solve everyone's financial situation. They will certainly help, um, and they're a good band-aid for many companies to get through the roughest part, but I think we all expect fallout from this. You can't completely shut down an economy and not expect to have some serious ramifications. And this is really different from 2008, 2009. This time, it, it's no one's fault. We can't point to one sector like the banks or real estate or tech firms. There's, there's no bubble that burst. Um, banks know that and also know that being empathetic and patient is certainly part of the solution. 
But what is important to know on the front end, particularly if you're looking for help from your lender to avoid serious problems, is that banks are not equity providers. They don't get to participate in any upside potential. So the expectation is that they will get their money back. Um, they may do other things to help you through the tough time, like deferring the principal payments or extending amortization or waiving covenants. But there's, there's never really an intent to participate in the loss with a business owner. And I think that's just really important to say it openly so that everyone has the same expectations. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the imperative part is communicating openly and, and often with your banker. Don't wait for them to come to you. Be proactive. Um, doing, during a period of uncertainty or downturn, you're going to get asked a lot of questions, many of which you yourself may not be confident answering. But it's still important to work with your bank uh, to attempt to plan for the future as best you can. I can guarantee you that your bank does want to help you and your success is in their best interest. No bank wants your assets or your guarantee. Um, there's a lot of steps to take uh, before we ever get to that point. So working cooperatively uh, will, will create greater outcomes for all parties. I was going to talk a little bit about steps you can take before your situation gets dire, but that's really Doug's expertise. And um, frankly, my best advice to clients heading into uncertain waters is to hire a professional who specializes in cash preservation or crisis management. So I will let Doug take it from there. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a good segue into Doug, your perspective right now. Oh, um, uh, Chris introduced herself. I'll introduce myself. I'm Doug Wilterdink. I'm a founder of DWH. We are a consulting firm that does, among other things, we do crisis management, uh, turnaround and structure work. Um, this is the space that we play in every day. Uh, usually it's not a result of some macro event. Most of the time it's some micro thing. But, um, but I just thought I would touch on a couple of things that really reinforce some of the things that Chris just talked about. Um, one of those is a broader concept around some of the softer things, so leadership skills to manage through a crisis. And then the second thing, get a little bit more specific into uh, liquidity and how to uh, manage liquidity in a crisis. So the first thing we'll talk about is the softer things, the, the leadership. So uh, the, the first thing to acknowledge is, is that leadership in, under ordinary times is different than leadership in a crisis environment. Um, just uh, if you think about a crisis environment, much like the survival shows on television. I, I tell people that you have to think about the skill sets that you see people on those TV shows having are different than what kind of Main Street uh, is like. So you have to think about the skills that are needed of leaders in crisis situations are simply just different. So I'll just give you some, some examples of that. Um, so so um, the first thing is, is there's, you've got to acknowledge that there is a, a, a difference, uh, that this is not ordinary times. You have to think that we're in a crisis mode and that long-term planning is probably not where you need to be. It is, it is survival. You have to think about how do I make sure I survive? So in order to do that, uh, just um, a few attributes, a pace of play changes. Um, instead of monthly, quarterly, annual planning cycles, uh, it might migrates to um, uh, daily and sometimes even hourly uh, planning cycles. So uh, think in, the, in terms of context of, of war rooms and uh, constant inf information changes and adapting to that, that information change. The second thing I would encourage people to think about is, is selecting the team for their uh, leadership that might not be the same as the leadership team of the business. Uh, you really have to think of people that can uh, think quick and, and implement quick uh, this is not a long-term planning process. Uh, uh, third uh, consideration is, is really be attentive to who the key stakeholders are. It is uh, very common for us to really help our clients think through uh, key stakeholders. We always talk about five groups, uh, customers, suppliers, employees, investors, including bankers, and then uh, the communities, and make sure that there's a clear understanding of the needs and expectations of each of those key stakeholders and you're attentive to those uh, needs and expectations. Uh, another thing is just a communication rhythm. And uh, Krista talked about communication with, uh, with banks. We would encourage communication with each of those stakeholders on a really aggressive uh, rhythm. Um, again, very frequently weekly to make sure that not only they know what's going on with you, but you know what's going on with them, and then you can adapt um, uh, to those circumstances. And then finally, 
uh, just uh, anticipate. Uh, you, there's a lot of what if modeling being done in these kinds of situations, got to anticipate the un unexpected and, um, and prepare for that. Um, a few other just uh, random things that aren't necessarily leadership skills, but things to think about is, uh, Krista mentioned this as well, but we are big advocates of stay close to your, uh, your outside advisors. So, so particularly bankers, as, as Krista even said, be proactive. Don't wait for your banker to come to you. Make sure you go to your banker. Make sure that the discussion is, is what you're doing to protect their interests. It's just a, a, a lot better to manage the conversation from, um, from the perspective you understand what they need, or if you don't understand to, to ask as opposed to wait for them to come to you. Second thing is stay close to, to your legal advisors. Um, and I say advisors because different lawyers uh, provide different uh, counsel. So uh, contract issues, labor issues, debtors, creditors, rights issues are just different and making sure that you're getting the right legal advice for the circumstances. Um, also, I'd en encourage people to stay close to the, um, the uh, community resources. So particularly uh, the economic development uh, folks, the, the Bright Place, uh, Chambers of Commerce, uh, they are a conduit to other resources for people facing situations that they haven't been through before. Um, uh, second thing I just want to touch on is um, liquidity. And again, Krista mentioned this, uh, it's kind of it's all about liquidity. Um, there's, there's all kinds of kind of common tools that are used by uh, people in these circumstances that aren't used outside these circumstances typically. Um, but what, um, what we always uh, suggest is, is get, get a good handle on uh, two aspects of your financial condition. One is balance sheet strength and two is uh, the liquidity within your balance sheet. And typically what you need is both of those to get through this in uh, relatively unscathed. So people can have strong balance sheets without liquidity or people can have liquidity without strong balance sheets, but you really need both. So um, the idea is, is if there's a strong balance sheet but no liquidity, the idea is, is how do you convert that into uh, liquidity so you can navigate through this. Uh, the primary tool uh, to navigate this is, uh, is a 13 week cash flow forecast. Most people that haven't been through some kind of uh, uh, financial uh, difficulties aren't familiar with that. Uh, folks like us live in, in with those every day, help clients uh, develop those and implement those all the time. Um, and then the, the last thing I just thought I'd throw out is just this idea of uh, cash levers. So uh, you use the 30 week cash flow forecast to help you identify cash levers, but, but cash levers are things that you can do that you wouldn't ordinarily do to generate some cash, generate some liquidity. And the way you identify that is just think through your uh, financials first. So think p &L. So cash levers are, are, how do I reduce my expenses to free up some cash? Uh, cash levers are in the balance sheet. So each balance sheet line item represents relationships in the marketplace that can be uh, renegotiated or repurposed to free up uh, cash. And then finally, you have to think about off balance sheet. So what uh, opportunities are there to infuse cash into your business that are not specifically identified through your financials. So a couple of examples are, uh, again, PPP or Main Street lending things that Krista mentioned. But also, particularly for smaller business, it's often family and friends. So it's, it's trying to identify where your uh, 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 resources are that might not be in, in your business, but might be outside your business that could become part of your business. Thank you, Doug. You know, one of the things, one of the common themes I'm seeing here is communication. Communication early, communication often, no surprises. And I'm curious, Holly, as we go to you, um, what kind of communication do you like to see from your clients early and often? Uh, that's a great question, Chris. Thank you. Um, I will also do a brief introduction of myself. I'm Holly Jackson. I've been practicing um, law ever since the first economic downturn in 2008. So um, it was a terrible time to start work in the field of real estate and business transactions. But um, I found myself uh, faced with unique challenges at that time for clients. And one of the things we recommend, um, we've kind of started talking about within the firm is the three F's, which is um, formation, financial, and follow-up. Um, if you weren't lucky enough in 2008 to 
you know, have started your careers then or be working through um, these unique challenges. Formation is a unique opportunity for you to get it right out of the gate. Um, right now, we probably are in the face of COVID-19 facing things that um, maybe we weren't prepared for. But if you start with a proper foundation, the formation of your company and working with um, a team of professionals like Doug had mentioned, um, team up with accountants and attorneys who specialize in their field, um, work with um, insurance and financial um, individuals and, and develop a strong management team. That's a really great starting point. But from there in the formation context, make sure that you have your entity structured correctly and that you have proper to proper capitalization out of the gate. Um, you should also be looking for in the formation phase to um, look for unique opportunities for expansion and understand your industry and kind of prepare for economic downturns. Um, but if you aren't in that position and formation um, wasn't done right at the outset, now is a perfect time to recalibrate. We think it's important to look at the financial condition of your entity and as Doug mentioned, be um, flexible and, and look for liquidity options. That will allow you to remain agile when things do turn, um, take a downturn. Um, and like I mentioned with financial, it's important to have proper capitalization from the start. Many clients often underestimate the true capital needs of their entity at the outset, and they don't plan for um, the unexpected, or they don't, um, they, maybe their projections are too um, rose colored. And they need to really be looking for opportunities to have um, liquidity, which creates agility in these times. And while borrowing is a necessary component for expansion and growth, we think it's important to not become overextended. Um, a strong balance sheet would be um, supportive of Doug's conversation earlier. And also to consistently review financial plans and proje projections and adjust accordingly. Um, and then finally, in the context of the final F, the follow-up, we like to see a comprehensive or holistic business plan. Not only are you forming your entity correctly and you're monitoring your financials and preparing for the rainy day, but also um, potentially looking for opportunities where you might have a strong estate plan that could govern um, asset protection and look for opportunities if you have a lending situation where you might be able to work out of um, having to be providing a personal guarantee for your company's borrowing needs. Um, and I always encourage clients to stop using their retirement plans for um, capitalization within their companies. It's a terrible idea, especially in times like this. Um, and to have insurance. I, I've seen a number of clients right now who are seeking business interruption insurance and they haven't reviewed the terms of their policy correctly, only to learn that right now it might not qualify for coverage. So those are the you know, key concepts that we think are necessary to um, come out of the gate strong, but also have an opportunity to recalibrate and stay financially strong. I definitely see another theme bubbling to the surface, which is liquidity. And I know, Bob, uh, you have some thoughts about um, how bankruptcy potentially could help with liquidity issues. But before we unmute Bob and uh, have him give his insights, I just want to remind everybody that you can submit questions via the Q&A feature. So we would be happy to entertain whatever questions come up. But Bob, I'll turn it to you. Go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us your thoughts, please. Great. Yeah, thanks for having me here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, my name is Bob Wolford. I'm the managing partner at Miller Johnson. Uh, I have over 20 years experience as well in, in turnarounds and workouts. Um, and uh, it's interesting, we, we, as Krista mentioned, when we started to talk um, about the content for today's discussion, one of the things that we really noted is that um, bankruptcy is really a tool it, it, and a very rarely used tool um, to deal with um, challenges regarding the solvency of a business. And that when people come to talk to Doug or myself or um, go to have, uh, or Holly, or have discussions with their lender, um, you know, so often we sit down and the first question they say it, it relates to bankruptcy or, or going bankrupt, but really what they're worried about is um, really preserving the going concern value of their business and maintaining shareholder control and preserving shareholder value to the extent it still exists. 
Um, and, and those are um, the challenges I think that, you know, if, if, if you're thinking about bankruptcy or insolvency that you're really focused on. And so liquidity is obviously a key driver of that. And, and I think what's going to be interesting coming out of this is that, uh, you know, everyone's focused right now on the PPP program and the liquidity bridge that that's providing so many businesses, um, not just you know, not just the mom and pop businesses, um, but as has been well publicized, also very large um, businesses. But the um, the importance of providing that liquidity bridge through this time of not working is obvious and it's critical. But I think what's equally critical and, and that what we still haven't faced is the fact that we have shut all these manufacturing businesses and all these retail businesses down and to start them again requires a significant investment of working capital. Um, and the PPP program is not designed to provide that. Um, to Krista's point, lenders um, generally lend on a formulaic basis that's not going to necessarily align with the working capital needs of their um, borrowers as we kind of emerge from this. And so I think what you're seeing, you're going to see some unique. Um, strategies developed by businesses over the next few months as to how to bridge that working capital need. And I think, you know, people like Doug um, are going to be able to provide businesses a ton of value in um, helping that. And I think you're already starting to see customers uh, in, the, in the manufacturing supply chain recognize the need to support their supply chains, um, liquidity needs as these businesses um, relaunch. And I think the other area, you know, again, there's been so much focus on the PPP and, and not, and we've all talked about the Main Street Lending Program, but it's not been the focus in the media or in, in people's minds. And, and I think the Main Street Lending Program and its ability to, pro, to allow companies to replace certain types of debt um, at a higher interest rate through this program might free up um, some ability to provide liquidity in addition to customer and lender sources. I think um, the other thing that we're going to see um, as part of our new normal is there's going to have to be another wave of consolidation that occurs um, through most industries, especially in the retail space where um, you're forced to um, <clears throat> operate at a smaller capacity. These businesses that were already you know, operating at very thin margins um, being forced to operate at 50 to, or less percent capacity, we'll need to figure out um, ways to um, increase the synergies and the efficiencies of those those businesses in order to to make them uh, again be able to remain a viable going concern. Uh, I think businesses are going to have an opportunity to be proactive in that regard. And then tying everything everybody said back in is getting through this is really all about aligning the, <clears throat> the the stakeholder interests as well as you can, and especially with respect to your creditors. And so to the extent that you can, uh, and, and the way that that's done is obviously through, through transparency, communication, um, proactive uh, um, engagement of professionals that, that add credibility to your, to your strategy. And, and again, um, recognizing the challenge and and uh, taking it on um, head on. Very good, thanks, Bob. You know, as we think about your creditors, they, they have balance sheets too. And, and that loan is actually an asset on the balance sheet of a bank. So I'm curious, Krista, if you could talk a little bit in banking, sometimes there's this concept of special assets. And what does it mean if your relationship banker introduces you to somebody who's on a special assets team? Right. So it, it's interesting. You hear the word special assets group. Your, your banker says, I'm going to introduce you, introduce you to a member of our special assets team. And unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily mean you've hit the jackpot and are considered special. Um, but it also doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't, doesn't equate to being kicked out of the bank either. The special assets teams are, are specially trained and qualified to work with companies through tougher times. Um, yes, their job is to protect the bank's assets and maximize the amount of loan repayment. But they also have the ability to 
react quicker than a middle market relationship uh, manager would be able to do. They have more flexibility and authority to find alternate, alternate solutions. Um, they know the laws better, frankly. Um, and, and they tend to be very direct because they are not as interested in selling you something or worried that you're going to leave the bank. They are in crisis management mode. So um, their, their main focus is to get you out of this pickle, right? So um, I know several businesses owners who have been in special assets groups sometime throughout their careers. And you get varying reactions, of course. You know, some say it was horrible and they would never, you know, want to be in it again. They'll do anything to avoid going into special assets. But others have said that it was a really valuable experience and it actually taught them to run their business uh, much more effectively for the long run. Um, the one piece of advice I would give uh, when, when working with a special assets team is, is, you know, we talked about this earlier, be transparent and communicative. Um, I know also a lot of special assets bankers who have said that uh, they work very cooperatively with, with clients um, until the trust is broken. And at that point, it, it, they'll go directly into asset protection mode. And it's very difficult to rebuild the trust after that. Yeah, you know, back in my time with public accounting, I, I've guided clients through special asset situations. Fortunately, not that frequently. Right. Uh, it's not something you want to have happen. You don't want it to have, have nope. it happen. Uh, and Doug, I bet you have a lot more experience than I do holding people's hands through this process. Do you have any insights? Yeah, this is a big part of what, what our practice is. It's very common. Um, in fact, I'll start with what's uncommon. It's pretty uncommon for companies that are experiencing some kind of a challenge to reach out to us directly. Um, it's more common that if, if a borrower is having these kinds of challenges, that they will uh, connect with us through their banker or through their lawyer. Um, as a general rule, um, probably 80% of the distress situations are the result of uh, a borrower being moved to special assets. The special assets um, uh, lender uh, often, not always, but requires the borrower then to see seek the uh, uh, assistance of outside professionals to help them navigate it. And, and the reason for that is, is two. One is, is because uh, often the borrower is just simply in a position they've never been before, they've never been trained to navigate these kinds of environments. And, uh, and then the second thing is, is that there's, a, there's different tools. Uh, it goes back to the liquidity issue as well. Uh, there's different tools that, that we help our clients that employ to help them make better decisions, to help them improve communicating, um, uh, and also to make sure they uh, are uh, engaged appropriately with other professionals. So it is, it's also, very common for our role in those situations to be a bit of a facilitator between uh, the banker, the borrower, and the respective lawyers for each of those, the creditors and debtors rights lawyers. And uh, uh, part of our job is to, is to uh, work with our clients to help them develop a business case for whatever they want to get done and advocate for them with their, uh, with their bankers and with the respective lawyers who will then uh, convert that into a, a document that people will follow as a guide uh, to navigate this. So Bob, you, um, yeah, bankruptcy is definitely one of the areas that you talked about as we were preparing. Um, and I, I hate to think about the word bankruptcy, but it could go hand in hand sometimes with special assets. What thoughts mm -hmm. do you have as we continue this discussion? Well, certainly uh, you, I, I would echo the comment that Krista made that um, all the constituents are working to avoid bankruptcy generally at all costs um, when you get into a situation like this. It's not great for a lender um, if you go into bankruptcy, uh, but it's also not great for the two things that I mentioned that we're really focused on, pre preserving going concern value and more importantly, preserving shareholder control. Most often the result of a bankruptcy proceeding is either a liquidation or a sale of the business to a third party. And so you're not really accomplishing your goal of preserving shareholder control if you, if you go into to bankruptcy most of the time. There are, there are limited and unique circumstances. For example, um, if you're trying to shed pension obligations or uh, if you have historic union, uh, union liabilities or, um, or significant environmental or, or historic um, um, product liability issues, you know, a bankruptcy filing might make sense. But, um, you know, as Doug would acknowledge, for, for every bankruptcy that I filed in my career, 
there are a hundred businesses that we've worked with that went through a process like this to Krista's point, went into special assets, came out and are, and I mean, that's how I've built my book of business with my clients is a lot of those clients come out, you work through a process like this, and then you've got a strong, viable, growing business after the fact. And so, um, you know, again, I think, um, especially in with a cyclical business, um, it's important to um, recognize the need to kind of continue to be able to to um, work through the cycles. And that's where I think Doug comes in. And that's where I think the um, transparency with your lender is so important and where um, Holly's three Fs are absolute critical to um, being able to navigate through something. It's important that you've got good good understanding and agreements amongst your shareholders and that your corporate structure is correct and that you're well capitalized so that you're really just talking about the company. You're not talking about the um, things like piercing the corporate veil or avoiding the corporate formalities. We all know that um, unless we're signing personal guarantees for company debt, we don't have personal liabilities as shareholders for the company's obligations unless we don't obey all those corporate formalities and and respect the, the separateness of that entity. And that's what um, the three Fs are intended to get at. Thanks, Bob. You know, I don't think that Chemical Bank or TCF or any bank really wants to own buildings and other assets other than the one that you're sitting in right now. But, uh, but collateral is certainly part of the lending relationship. But Chris, I'm just curious if you could give some insight. Will there be any need for new appraisals or anything like that with collateral? Sure. So, so um, one of the first things that happens when um, things start to go south is the bank needs to shore up its position. They need to know what they have. They need to understand what what their first way out, second way out, and potentially third way out are. So, um, one of the ways to do that is to appraise your assets and know what they're worth. the The problem, is, you know, that there's always an argument over what 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 uh, assets are worth, right? The the borrower usually thinks they're worth more than, than an appraisal or what the lender might say they're worth, and they discount them down for, for reasons exactly like today. Um, if we had to sell assets in an environment today, who's going to buy them, right? So the, our, our whole point as bankers is we don't ever want to have to sell your assets. We want you to sell your assets, and really we want you to perform and, and create cash flow and then help us sell your assets if you need to and get the best value we can. But if we had to go out and sell assets in a, in a really down time, that's never when you want to sell. So, but understanding what our worst case position is, is important to know um, so that we know what our potential loss is, what, what we can get out of, and how much more money we can lend you, really. Appreciate that. Um, so, you know, as I think about this, I mean, and Holly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move over to you for a second here. Um, you know, because Krista had talked about this is not the time that you want to sell, uh, but you know, here's something unusual this time. What if you actually wanted to start a business? I mean, I, I've been, one of the things I've been seeing is that there's so much negative that we could focus on, but every time you have a crisis like this, it's an opportunity for reinvention. And I've seen a lot of creativity and I've seen people be very nimble. And we've even seen like situations, for example, where breweries or distilleries are suddenly making hand sanitizer and steel cases, making personal protective equipment. Uh, and so I wonder, I mean, what if you wanted to start a business uh, right now? Um, what are your thoughts there? I think that's a great question, Chris. Um, it, it might be a perfect opportunity to start a business right now, especially if you have a unique offering to the marketplace. Um, right now, if you were to be a startup, again not to harp on it but capitalization is going to be a key and liquidity is going to be very important important and working with to like working to identify financial and you know kind of industry cycles so that you can prepare for um the changing tide and if you have something interesting to bring to the marketplace right now it's a unique time frame to do it um, and and you should certainly explore those opportunities I know still um, our our firm has not seen any downturn with respect to people who are still interested in um, either acquiring a, a, an equity position in 
other entities that may exist or working with others to um, create new development opportunities. We have um, a, a large transaction going right now that might end up having a franchise opportunity in the Detroit area and expanding over into West Michigan. So people are still considering um, development and working and moving forward. Um, so I think now is a perfect time to um, look at how you want to structure everything and to get an attorney involved right away and to maybe even talk to people like Doug and Krista and figure out the best way to enter the marketplace. Sure. And, and Doug, um, you know, you're helping clients a lot of times in troubled situations. And, and I want to ask you to follow up on what Holly said. I do want to remind everybody, you can put questions into the Q&A. Uh, we've got some terrific expertise here and uh, it's a chance for you to pick their brains. But Doug, as we piggyback on what Holly had to say there, do you have any thoughts about starting a business in this environment? Sure. Um, there's a, there's uh, starting a business and there's also acquiring a business. Uh, uh, this first thing I, I just mentioned is that uh, situations like this creates um, so, so as much as there's a lot of discussion about distress, it also creates some incredible opportunity. Uh, there's certain businesses and certain industries right now that are performing exceptionally well. If you're in the grocery business right now, given that people are not going to bars and restaurants for dinner, uh, the grocery stores are doing really well, and those uh, businesses that, that supply grocery stores are doing very well right now. So what does that mean? Those businesses are likely to have capital. Those businesses are strengthening their balance sheet and increasing their liquidity and are often using that to uh, deploy it into opportunities to either invest or to acquire um, other businesses or other assets from businesses that don't have that balance sheet, uh, sheet strength and liquidity. So um, sometimes if you're gonna start a business, you need to certainly have access to capital and sometimes a source of access like of the capital are other businesses that are performing well to partner with them to uh, to navigate this and in, and another component is goes back to the the appraisal idea um, asset valuation idea is in uh, periods of uh, market downturns asset values decline uh, real estate real and personal property uh, values as well as just business enterprise value often de decline so there's significant opportunity to acquire businesses at a, a low point in the marketplace um, and and ride the market back up so it's actually for those people that have remember you talked about the balance sheet strength and liquidity earlier uh, if you have a business with balance sheet and liquidity now's the time to start looking at how do you deploy that to create more value if you don't and you want to start a business it is uh, is uh, very good to look at it, uh, potentially aligning yourself and partnering with those uh, businesses that do. Very good. You know, something that seems um, a common theme here, and something that when I talk to people, you know, when they think about bankruptcy, and, and Bob, I know you're probably the right person to address this question, but I mean, there's almost a stigma associated with, with a bankruptcy situation, uh, maybe even like a, a failure. So, I'm just curious, could you talk briefly about aversion to bankruptcy, maybe some myths, realities? Should, be, should people be afraid of it or is it okay to go through bankruptcy? It, uh, we need to unmute you, Bob, right there. There we go, sorry right. about that. <clears throat> um, the, uh, I, I don't think, again, I think under the proper circumstances, if, if it accomplishes your goal, again, your goal being to maintain shareholder control and to preserve equity value, uh, it can make a lot of sense. Um, I think the reason there's such an aversion to it is that absent extraordinary circumstances, you don't see businesses enter into bankruptcy and exit bankruptcy with the same ownership. And so if the shareholders are deciding um, to put the business into bankruptcy, um, they're, they're most likely saying, you know, all we're trying to do here is, is to preserve the going concern value, to preserve the jobs, to facilitate a transaction of some sort. And so um, part of the reason why you're trying to avoid that is, um, you know, you're not, you're, you're losing control of your company when you do it. And so um, businesses that have gone through bankruptcy um, you're, you are able to go into bankruptcy 
reorganize, confirm a bankruptcy plan that pays your creditors over a five-year period, um, and uh, by the shareholders putting new money in, it's a it's it's a longer than we have to explain right now, but the, that you can come out of bankruptcy and still retain your equity. People that can go through that process, do that, and retain their shares. Um, there's no stigma associated with that at all. I mean, you, you've, you've accomplished your goal. Um, and, um, and so, it, and if you're going through a bankruptcy to facilitate a pension termination or something like that, and you're able to maintain control, again, no stigma associated with that, but it's very difficult to um, go into bankruptcy because you're experiencing liquidity challenges and fix those inside of a bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is extremely expensive. Bankruptcy requires you to pay the fees of all kinds of different constituents. Other parties are brought to the table. And more importantly, um, from a shareholder perspective, there is extreme scrutiny placed on six years of transactions between the company and its shareholders um, as a part of that bankruptcy process. And so most of the time, people are not looking to subject themselves to that scrutiny unnecessarily, absent some extreme benefit. Very good. We, um... We have a question from the audience here, and I'll, I'll leave this open, uh, whoever wants to grab it here. But is there a certain industry that is facing the most risk for bankruptcy in Grand Rapids? And I'll let the first person answer that. Uh, I guess um, I'll take a stab, and, and I'm sure Doug has some thoughts too. But from my perspective, uh, I, I think the manufacturing industry, um, especially automotive, are going to have some businesses struggle to have the liquidity necessarily to, necessary to get their um, get their businesses relaunched that have shut down shut down their factories, um, and so I think that's going to be an area where we're going to see again to Doug's point. There's also a ton of opportunity associated with that because when a business needs capital and you're able to provide that capital, you can often negotiate very good terms of entry. And I think a lot of people that were able to invest and had capital in 2007, 2008 made a ton of money. And this is going to be the same. Um, I think um, the other obvious area is retail. I mean, re restaurants and retail. I don't know how, um, you know, I, I, I just, I don't know how that's going to work when restaurants were struggling to make money up, you know, at 110% capacity. And now we're going to be told they can have 30 to 50. So, um, I think that's going to be part of our new normal, and, and we'll see. I, I myself am dying to eat a hot restaurant meal and not one that's cold by the time I get it home. So, Yeah, yeah so I, let, me, let me just uh, add to that. I, um, I agree with Bob completely. I think certainly retail, that, that's most obvious for most consumers. Uh, if Bob mentioned auto. I just expand on that. I think any uh, part, any business, a manufacturing business or distribution business, that is part of the supply chain of, of complex capital goods. So capital goods, certainly autos, um, you know, furniture, appliances, uh, uh, heavy equipment, those kinds of things. Those are long-term investments. Uh, we're in a period where people are, are uh, gonna be concerned about short-term liquidity, not getting the best return on long-term investments uh, from um, business to business situations, buying, uh, you know, new heavy equipment, uh, buying buildings. I think that, that that's going to be a while before that rebounds in any substantive way. And then from a consumer uh, capital goods like autos and appliances, things like that, there's a significant amount of uh, liquidity challenges within just families and households that people are going to try and shore up their, their financial health before they start buying those things. So I think the, uh, the businesses that are tied to capital goods are going to be um, uh, the toughest to rebound out of this. Thank you. You know, we're getting close. I mean, we've got about 10 minutes left here. Um, but I think that one thing that is on a lot of people's minds right now, we, Congress put together the 800 and some page CARES Act. And yes, I've dug into it some and I imagine the two lawyers have as well. Um, and, you know, it's, and then there are more questions than answers sometimes. And one of the things that people wonder about is, oh, now I have a paycheck protection loan. Is this going to be forgiven? And, um, and I know that the banks have to follow SBA guidance and they're working. So Krista, maybe you could comment briefly on the bank's role with this forgiveness and what you know. 
Yeah. So in a, in a short sentence, we don't know much. And <laughs> um, it's difficult because um, I, I'm actually less concerned about how much is going to be forgiven. I think it's, I, I think the, generally speaking, what was, what was loaned on the front end is, is going to turn out to be the okay numbers. What I'm more concerned about is they've given no guidance on process. What information do they need? What, what documents do you need to provide? What's the real calculation? Um, you know, what, exactly what's the time period that's covered? Because that's even up for debate a little bit. Um, so those are the more unknowns of, of how it's all going to work. And it's going to be in a very, very short time frame. So I know that on the front end, when um, the CARES Act was passed and they basically gave the, weeks of, the banks a week to figure out how to get it started, I'm afraid they're going to do it the same on the back end. And we all know it's coming, but without the guidance, it's, it's very hard to prepare um, an internal process for doing that. So I'm, I'm a little worried about that. Sure. I, I've seen this in, you know, some of the things I think about too is when you dig in, I mean, there are provisions, for example, if you don't get the loan forgiven, you can kick the social security tax payments down the road a couple of years. And sometimes I even wonder how that's going to filter into things. I mean, Doug, you know, one of the provisions is companies can, if they want to, in certain circumstances, take the social security tax payments and kind of spread that out. Do you think there's any risk with, um, taking, you know, short-term liquidity, something that helps in the short term, but in the long term, people will forget about the fact that they kicked the can down the road. Certainly there's risk. Um, I, I, just uh, maybe a couple thoughts on that. Again, uh, in order to get to the longer term, you got to survive the short term. So short-term liquidity is really critical. We've been saying that since uh, since this started. But I think beyond that is, uh, to, to go back to your, your question, Chris, it's really about forecasting. You have to build a forecast that layers in those obligations that you know that someday you're going to have to take care of, whether that's PPP, whether that's uh, catching up on FICA, whether that is um, catching up on uh, creditor obligations, uh, rental obligations. Um, ultimately, uh, they, they have to be planned for, they've got to be modeled out, and you need to make sure that you um, you have a plan to take care of those. That plan will will uh, need to be flexible because this can be dependent on what your revenue stream is. but there, therein lies the idea of using a forecast, a robust forecast, to also communicate with your stakeholders. Most of the stakeholders, I mean, business is, is a series of interdependencies. It's a sim, sim, uh, system. So uh, people depend on each other. What people uh, want is, is uh, transparency, honesty, uh, and some evidence that you're uh, uh, making sound business decisions on their behalf. So as long as you're doing those things and, and modeling those things out and effectively communicating, uh, uh, people will work with you to get through these these times. That's good advice. I mean, yeah, even if you take a PPP loan and and you use it for only the the certain things you're supposed to use it for, like payroll benefits, you know, rent and utilities. Uh, if if there were any portion that were not forgiven, I mean, I'm, I've talked to some business owners that have said, "Oh boy, I don't know if I could repay that in 18 months," which effectively after the deferral period is what happens. So I appreciate that insight. We do have another audience question here. Uh, I'm going to try to summarize this. Was there something that business owners were doing that they should not have been doing? Or is there something that business owners weren't doing that they should have been doing to stave off bankruptcy? So in other words, to prevent bankruptcy, is there something we should have been doing that we should have, or they shouldn't have, or vice versa, right? Do we have any advice for keeping out of that situation? Can, I can offer up something. I, it's repeating what we talked about before, but I think it, it's our experience again, that the best practices are for business owner operators to be paying really close attention to building balance sheet strengths and balance sheet liquidity simultaneously over time. Um, there's a, a lot of examples of companies that build balance sheet strength. They're advised to build, to build balance sheet strength, but they forget the liquidity part. So what does that mean is, is that they continue to reinvest any excess liquidity as opposed to making sure that there's some, what we can refer to as dry powder available to navigate uh, difficult times. So, um, so the, this idea of making sure that, uh, you know, that consistently focused on uh, metrics around balance sheet strength, but also liquidity, it's gotta be both. Can't be one or the other, it's gotta be both. 
And I would just follow up with Doug, totally agree with that. And, and two quick things. One, just because a bank will give you a loan doesn't mean that, you know, levering your balance sheet is the best thing to do. Um, and secondly, watch dividends. Uh, in really good times, it's, it's very attractive to want to take money out of the company and um, go do other things with it. And probably you might have better investment opportunities to do that, but just be cautious of how much money you're taking out of your company so that you can continue to build your balance sheet. Very good. Yeah, it's, it's all about balancing, I think, sometimes the short game with the long game. Um, it, you know, keeping that, that, long, that long view um, sometimes. So as we, uh, we're getting ready to wrap up here. I mean, we have about five minutes left. Um, I'd like each of you to look at two final questions here. What is, you know, right now there's so much fear. So one of the things I think about is what comforts you right now? So we'll start with Krista. We're going to go around the panel. But what's one thing that comforts you right now? And what's one thing that still scares you? So I think what keeps coming to mind for me, what, what comforts me just in general, is the rallying together, not just of our community, but of um, competitors in the same industry even. Um, the, the, the nation has rallied, and, and I feel like uh, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement by everybody that we're all in this together, and we're all going to be part of the solution. So that's, that's a feel-good thing, but, um, but that does give me comfort for the future. And something that scares me, prob probably two quick things. One is um, the government pot potentially becoming a partner to the banks and the Main Street Lending Program. I don't know how that's going to work, but that does scare me a little bit. Um, and the other thing is real estate. I, don't, I just don't know what, what office space real estate is going to look like in the future. Are we all going to be working from home you know, more, much more often. And what does that mean for our office space? Are we not going to see each other? I'm a people person. I need to be around people, but I get it, right? I mean, we can't be, we can't have 100 people in a room. That doesn't make sense either. So what that's going to mean on our real estate office buildings, I don't know, but it scares me. Thank you. And Doug, uh, something that comforts you, something that scares you? So maybe a quick thing, a couple things on the comfort is consistent with what Krista said. I think just acknowledging that business is a series of, of, of interdependencies and for people that really recognize that and uh, work those relationships to make sure that uh, you find common ground and mutual benefit, um, that um, those are the ones that are going to find ways through this. Um, I also think uh, this, is a, this is an investment um, opportunity of a lifetime. It's it's going to be a rare thing, I think, for those people that do have that balance sheet and liquidity that um, that they're going to see uh, investment opportunities like they have right now. The thing that scares me, uh, frankly, is uh, right in our world, and that is it, it's a rare thing for us to find people that have experience dealing with these kinds of things. Very good. Holly, we'll pose the same questions to you there. Uh, thank you. I, one of the things that's, that's comforting to me is that um, just – kind of echoing Krista's comments and Doug's comments, but also to expand on it, that we are in West Michigan, and this is a community that's um, full of entrepreneurs and people who have the spirit to survive this economic downturn. Um, and I think you're seeing that. I think you're seeing um, communities coming together and business leaders working together. Um, and I, I think that will continue. We are very lucky to live in this part of the world and have those resources available to us. Um, the things that are a little scary are the lack of definitive guidance from the IRS on particularly how the PPP uh, loans will be handled, not only from a forgiveness standard, but also from a deductibility standard. Um, will they allow us to deduct the expenses that we pay using the PPP loan funds? Um, it's still a little unclear. And so the lack of guidance from the IRS and also maybe sometimes in leadership at that level is a little bit frightening, but I'm confident that just like we did before in 2008, we will make it through this. Yeah, that was kind of, I mean, the CARES Act is very explicit. This is not taxable if it's forgiven, but then the IRS came out with that announcement, which I guess didn't surprise me, but I, uh, I, don't, I don't blame, I think we're gonna see some relief. I'm hopeful, I should say I'm hopeful there. But uh, Bob, uh, the same questions to you, something that makes you feel good and scary. Sure, I'll, I'll be quick. I, I think something that makes me feel comforted to some degree is that everybody's in this boat. I, you know, what I mean, the um, and and to Holly's point, we are from West Michigan, which is a strong, vibrant community where um, we we do collaboratively, especially in the business community, a lot of the things necessary to remain strong. And so, 
Um, I think that's great. I think the, the scary thing to me right now is the politicization of this and uh, you know the the what the impact that that's going to have on um, the ability to get back to things normally the uh, as quickly as possible and and um, and the impact that that's going to have on um, on our communities so th those would be my answers to those questions yeah there's going to be a new normal well we're at the end of the uh, the webinar here I want to thank each of our panelists for taking time out of your day to provide your insights. And I know um, Dean Lawson, I think as we wrap things up, you have just maybe a final thought or two. Yes, thanks. Um, Chris, thank you for moderating this panel. And to Krista, Doug, Holly, and Bob, you did a terrific job. Your levels of ex the breadth of expertise and experience, the perspective, and, and looking at the silver linings as well as the challenges that our businesses are facing and providing good guidance was really, really valuable. I, I think what I take away from this, from what all of you said, is that people and organizations are here to help our companies, our businesses that are struggling. Whether you're thinking about bankruptcy or not sure what to do next, there are a lot of there's a lot of expertise out there and people in West Michigan are willing to help. So don't be afraid to ask questions. As many as you need to, to ask, the silver lining is we're all here and we're all willing to help you do that. So thank you all for taking the time today in doing this and for helping the West Michigan business community. I wanna make a short note of, of our next upcoming webinars. In this webinar series, our next webinar is in two weeks on the 29th of May at 1 p.m. And it's navigating supply chain disruptions. I think one of the biggest areas of business that have been disrupted are supply chains, especially if they are global supply chains. And the, as we look at the world, it's as we can come out of COVID, it's not going to look the same over the next year, two years, and we don't know about five to 10 years from now. So supply chain, uh, this should be a really interesting panel discussion. The other uh, webinar series that we have is Leadership Conversations on COVID-19 and the Public Trust. And that is being uh, hosted by our Kuzi Ethics Center. And that next um, webinar is on the 21st of May, a Thursday at noon. And the topic of that one is reimagining capitalism for the 21st century. Our panelists on that will be Fred Keller uh, and Jerry Davis. Jerry Davis is from the University of Michigan and Fred Keller is from Cascade Engineering. So once again, thank you to all of the participants, the panelists and to Chris and to all of the audience. Thanks for tuning in. These are available. Uh, for others, if you know others who might benefit from this, they're available on our Seedman YouTube channel as well as on our web, our webinar page. So have a great afternoon. It looks like the sun is trying to come out. So if you have a chance, go outside and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.